Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour ish that you'll spend anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us here on Facebook and on YouTube as we raise your health IQ. And today we're going to be talking about eggs. A lot of us think that eggs are a health food, right? They're part of the staple healthy breakfast, but are we off base about that? Are we being mislaid? Because today we're going to be looking at the surprising amount of cholesterol that is found in an egg and what that could mean for your health. Could that spell clogged arteries or are eggs really a, a health food and you have clean arteries? Well, to break everything down egg style, we're going to break the yolk with Dr. Neil Barnard here in just a little bit. And if you have a question that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard today, you can go ahead and post that in the comments or the chats. You can also tweet it to me using the hashtag exam room live. We also have a couple of other questions already in the hopper uh, about eggs. How much cholesterol then is in an egg white compared to a regular egg? And we had a viewer write in wondering about eggs and diabetes. Is there a connection there? We'll be tackling that. And then off the egg subject, we also have a question from a viewer who wrote in wondering about vitamin B12. They said that they went vegan more than a year ago, but have not been taking vitamin B12. So how long does B12 stay stored in the body? And are they in trouble? We're going to answer that question for them as well. But let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag right now and welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the exam room live and start prescribing some answers for everybody. Buddy, Dr. Barnard, so thank you so very much for being here, my friend. Hi there, Chuck. Great to be with you today. It's my pleasure. And I know eggs have been a hot topic for us uh, at the Physicians Committee for a long time. So I'm really glad that you and I are going to get the opportunity to clear up some confusion. And so why don't we just go ahead and jump right in and answer the first question that we have from a viewer. How much cholesterol is actually in an egg? Uh, a lot. Um, the eggs are the, eggs are the highest cholesterol food that there is. Um, roughly 200 milligrams in a given egg. Now the amount will vary um, because people have been concerned about cholesterol, and so with breeding techniques and different feeding techniques, you can manipulate the amount of cholesterol in an egg. But it's never anything other than very high, and that is because um, the chicken lays the egg and that egg is sitting there and the egg is not calling out for room service or anything that the chick inside the egg has to make bones, skin, organs, feathers, and everything from what was laid um, on the day that that egg, that egg came out of the mom. And so that means there's a huge amount of cholesterol and a lot of everything else so that when the chick pops out, you've got feathers and a beak and eyes and everything all made together requires a lot of cholesterol to build those animal tissues. And that's the reason it's there. Um, if you eat it, it will add to your cholesterol level. And how does the amount of cholesterol in an egg compare to some of the things that you would find in a drive through uh, per chance? I know that like when you compare it, I think I've seen on our website, as a matter of fact, when you stack it up against a Big Mac, it's pretty comparable, right? Yeah, uh, and there are really two considerations. One is the cholesterol itself, which is what we've been talking about. And there has been sort of a half-hearted debate over the years as to whether cholesterol that you eat actually adds to cholesterol in your blood. It does. Um, when you look at the data, it's really quite clear. But the effect of eating cholesterol, the, the cholesterol part of the egg, is not as bad as the saturated fat that's in eggs and in animal products and so forth too. So yeah, there's maybe 200 milligrams of cholesterol in an egg, but you have two eggs, you got also a little more than three grams of saturated fat. That stimulates your body to make more cholesterol. So the drive-through, um, you get the sandwich that might have egg in it, might have meat in it, might have cheese in it. Those saturated fats that are there are big drivers of cholesterol production in your body. And we have a follow-up question, somebody wondering, well, then how much cholesterol is found in egg whites? Zero. Um, it's all in the yolk 
Um, but the egg white is a whole big glob of unnecessary animal-based protein that you're better off without. All right. Uh, now, here's an interesting question about eggs. Haven't heard this connection just yet. We have one from Britt who wrote and said that a friend recently told them uh, that eggs can cause diabetes. Have you heard anything about that? Yes. Um, this has been an issue for quite a number of years. Um, and the data all really come from observational studies where you look at egg eaters. And what you see is the more eggs they eat, the higher their risk of developing diabetes. Um, it's been a repeated finding. It does seem convincing. Nobody has exactly identified why that would be, except that uh, anytime you have a diet that's got a lot of animal fat in it, meat fat uh, or, or the fat in eggs, um, that does tend to lead toward insulin resistance, which brings you toward diabetes. So yeah, these are observational studies. They're believable, but nobody's done a randomized trial where for five years you feed some people eggs and you feed others no eggs and you see if, the, if you come out better with by avoiding the eggs. People haven't done that. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Aliana. She wrote this one at 1207, said, my parents are convinced that eating cholesterol does not affect your cholesterol levels. Is that really true? She's just looking for clarification here. Um, it is true that cholesterol you eat does raise your blood cholesterol, but you, I, you are under, it's, it's understandable that your parents would be confused because the egg industry has spent millions upon millions of dollars to try to make that go away. Um, and in 2015, everything just really hit the fan. The egg industry, um, through documents that I can share with you, um, released a number of studies where they tried to make the effect of eggs on cholesterol levels look very small. Um, and they convinced the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee to not set a specific ceiling on eggs. Um, so they didn't say, prior to that, they'd said, don't have more than about 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day, which is about maybe an egg and a half, something like that. Um, uh, but they, in 2015, they removed the ceiling. But they didn't say that cholesterol doesn't matter. What they did say was eat as little cholesterol as possible, meaning don't eat eggs. So uh, it's understandable that people are confused about it, but cholesterol you eat raises your cholesterol in the same way as somebody could argue that if you eat sugar, it won't get into your blood. But that's a pretty hard argument to make. And cholesterol you eat is the same way it gets into your blood. Here's a great question from Colleen. This is at uh, 1207 as well. She's watching today on YouTube, basically asking, well, if not eggs, what? What are some good egg replacements that you might suggest? Oh, well, there are lots and lots of things. Um, uh, for, first of all, uh, if you're having breakfast and you make a big bowl of, of oatmeal and you flavor it up with some cinnamon and raisins and sliced bananas and things like that, you're getting no cholesterol, unlike the egg. You're getting effectively no bad fat, unlike the egg. And also unlike the egg, which, which is going to raise your cholesterol, oatmeal, oat products have soluble fiber, which the egg doesn't have, and they tend to lower your cholesterol level a little bit too. Um, now, if you want to have something that's really more eggy, um, if you have scrambled eggs in the morning, have you ever tried scrambled tofu? Now, Americans are nervous about tofu, but once they discover that tofu is almost identical to egg white in that it picks up the flavors that it's cooked with um, and has no animal protein, no animal anything, um, it works out really, really very well. You, you add a little bit of soy sauce, a little nutritional yeast, and and uh, flavor it up and, and you'll find yourself really liking it. There are, are, of course, all kinds of new vegan egg substitutes that are now on the market. You could try them if you want to. There are lots of things to eat. You don't need eggs. Let's switch gears here and tackle another topic. We got a good question from Kevin this week. He said, I went vegan in March of 2020, but still didn't take any vitamin B12 supplements because of the cost. Will my vitamin B12 level be very low? Yeah, very likely it will. And you should be taking a vitamin B12 sub supplement by all means. Um, they are not typically terribly expensive, but look at different brands and see which one you can get. Um, let me just recap why this is so important. Um, you need vitamin B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And if you don't have them, eventually you can even get uh, nerve symptoms that can be permanent. Um, so you don't want to play with that. Um, now, 
if you go into a health food store, what you will see is a whole range of products. And the, the amount of, of B12 you actually need is 2.4 micrograms. You look on the shelf, and here's one with 10,000 micrograms you know, or something like that. They're enormous. You don't need that that much. So if you're getting one of these big ones, don't take it every day. Take it every other day or break it in half or something like that. Or you can go online and you'll find them maybe around 100 or 200 micrograms per pill. That's that's plenty. So uh, you, you don't want to not have it. And uh, I would go ahead and start supplementing right away. Um, your doc doctors can measure your B12 adequacy. They can, they can see if you're low or not, but, but I would presume it, it, the safe thing to do is to presume that you will be low and make sure that you take it. Sticking with B12, we have a question from Richard who writes, I've heard that B12 is not found in plants, but I was recently told that it is in sea moss. Is there any truth to that? Maybe. Um, people have looked at a, a variety of sea plants and have found what looks like B12 in them. In some cases, it's analog, meaning that it's not biologically active. Um, so stay tuned. Um, but I would strongly encourage everybody to take a supplement. And by, by the way, um, for vegans, absolutely take a supplement. For people who are not yet vegan, people who are omnivores, they ought to take a supplement too, because a lot of them are low in B12. And that's because to get it out of animal products, you need um, there are really two issues. One is you need stomach acid to be able to pull the B12 off the animal protein, which a lot of people aren't making. And secondly, medications very often goof up B12 absorption. Metformin, acid blockers, they interfere with, with it so that you go into a hematology clinic, most of the B12, most of the people who are low on B12, they're not vegans, they're, they're omnivores who are not absorbing it very well. A supplement will cover those things. Now, in your book, Your Body Imbalance, you talk a lot about hormonal imbalance. And we have somebody right now in the chat room going back to eggs. We're wondering if there's a connection between hormonal balance and egg consumption. Um, eggs fit into, obviously, they're an animal product. And so they fit into the category of foods that don't have any fiber at all. If you don't have fiber in your diet because you're busily eating eggs and chicken breast, and yogurt and all of these things, they, they have no fiber. What tends to happen is that certain hormones build up in your blood. Now, partly that's because animal products, dairy products contain hormones, they contain estrogens in particular, but it's also because to get rid of excess estrogens, your body requires fiber. The fiber in your digestive tract carries them out. Um, if estrogens build up in, for a woman, a lot of things happen. Uh, menstrual pain, uh, fibroids, endometriosis, fertility issues, and of course, breast cancer over the long run are all linked to elevated levels of estrogen. Fiber is a good thing. So check out the eggs, bring fiber back in. We have a question from Leftist Erper on Twitter. Big fan of the show, big fan of yours, Dr. Barnard. And they want to know, is the percentage of fat and carbs and protein in your diet supposed to be different if you're eating a plant-based diet? Well, the amount that you need is um, is not going to change. Um, I mean, the amount that you need is something that our species evolved with. Um, we need a tiny amount of fat, um, and it's really very small. Maybe two, three, four percent of our calories should come from essential fats, um, and plants have you covered there. Uh, and then most of your nutrition will come from carbohydrates because starches sugars, those are the carbohydrates, they break apart to give glucose to your brain and to your muscles and to all the rest of you. And it's your body's favorite fuel. And you need some protein, not very much, but there's plenty of protein in vegetables and beans and, and grains, and that's got you covered. So the amount doesn't change. Um, when people are on meaty diets, what happens is the fat goes up, the protein goes up, the carbohydrate goes to zero, and they're on a diet that mother nature never intended for us. And to follow up to that, they also write that uh, they have PCOS and they're wondering, does that change the nutrient requirements that they may have? Oh, wow. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for um, asking about that. There are so many women whose ears just perked up now because um, PCOS, polycystic over, over, ovary system, syndrome, polycystic ovary syndrome is a condition where it's very frustrating for women. Part of the frustration is that their symptoms befuddle their doctors too. 
And so they're not getting adequate treatment. They're not even getting a halfway decent diagnosis. And in your body and balance, I devote a whole chapter to this. And in it, um, we describe how PCOS responds very well to a low fat plant-based diet, effectively the same kind of diet that we use for diabetes. That sounds funny, but that's because insulin resistance plays a role in PCOS, just like it does in diabetes. So getting the animal products out, keeping the oils really low helps a lot. And um, by the way, Chuck, uh, in that chapter, we tell the story of Allison Tierney, who is a, a skilled registered dietitian in Wisconsin, who has been a guest on this program and talks uh, about how her own um, uh, PCOS was dramatically changed once she started a healthy plant-based diet. Oh my gosh, she is the coolest. I highly recommend uh, going back through the archives and listening to that interview. If you need some inspiration in your life, that that is definitely one of the interviews that you want to take a listen to. Um, follow up on the cholesterol front, question from Karen DeCosta at 1214. Do nuts or avocados cause LDL to raise? Uh, a trace, yes, uh, they could, um, at least in theory. Um, the reason is that unlike most other animal products, um, which are extremely low in fat, nuts and avocados are sort of the exceptions where they have a fair amount of fat and a trace of that fat is saturated fat. So in theory, that could cause a slight elevation in your LDL. But um, that said, these products have nowhere near the saturated fat content that you'll see in animal products. So it's only traces. And for whatever reason, when almonds and other nuts are specifically studied, there seems to be some property in them separate from the saturated fat they have, which counteracts that effect. And, and it may actually lead to cholesterol lowering for some people. So what am I saying? I'm saying there is fat in them. There is some saturated fat that would tend to raise cholesterol levels, but we don't really see this being any kind of practical issue when people are consuming those foods. Now they got fat. The fat is a dense source of calories. It will slow down your weight loss if you're having a big guacamole fest every night. Um, but um, the fat, the, the quality of the fat is far better than for animal products, obviously. Bulent just had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's the opera singer that went from skinny guy to super muscular guy, uh, was named one of PETA's 50 sexiest vegans over 50. Uh, anyway, uh, he's got a question about avocados. As a matter of fact, we were just talking about that. Just a quickie. Do you know whether or not the pits of avocados are toxic? Oh, great question. Um, sh short answer. No, they're really not. Um, uh, the longer answer is that there have been some traces of, of, of compounds that are found in them that found in the pits that if for some reason you were man, you managed to eat a whole lot of avocado pits, um, they could ultimately be toxic, but no, um, in no, they aren't. I'm not entirely sure how a person eats an avocado, pit, but the, the, and I wouldn't recommend it unless you know the Heimlich maneuver, but, um, but no, they're not toxic. Yeah, I, w I was wondering the same thing. Like, wh what would an avocado pit taste like? And you need a chainsaw to get through that thing anyway. So uh, maybe not not worth the effort. Uh, question from Sash at 1219. Do we need salt to be healthy? Yeah, you do. Um, uh, salt has sodium in it. And sodium has a bad reputation. And it has a bad reputation for good reason. It raises your blood pressure. Um, it can also cause your body to lose a little bit of calcium if you have a lot of salt in your diet, your kidneys get reset to kick calcium out. So that's not good. However, salt is an electrolyte. You need a little bit of salt for um, healthy nerve transmission and a number of other things in your diet. So a little bit of salt is normal and good. You don't have to go too far with it. You don't have to add salt and cooking real. You'll, 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 you'll get some uh, trivial amounts from, uh, the foods themselves. And if you add little bits of salt here and there, that's fine. If you do, my tip is that you use an iodized salt because that'll give you not just sodium, a little bit of sodium, but uh, some iodine that your thyroid needs. And I would keep your total sodium intake to two grams, 2,300 uh, uh, milligrams, something like that. Um, if you go higher than that, your blood pressure is going to start to go up. 
Let's talk about chicken momentarily here. We have a good question from Kyle. A lot of people think chicken is the healthy meat, but Kyle is wondering at 1221, is poultry actually lean? Oh, wow. Great question. Uh, no, it's not. Um, this is back in the 1950s. And people were starting to really open the door to the idea that the fatty junk Americans were eating was driving their cholesterol levels up. Um, obviously, people looked at bacon and they looked at beef. And these are high fat, high cholesterol foods. So the, the market was for chicken. If you take the skin off the chicken, it's lower in fat. And, and there's some truth to that. However, you send the chicken to the laboratory and you find several things. First of all, it's not really very low in fat at all, even without the skin, even without the dark meat, you throw it away. You, you, you don't use any fat in cooking. That white meat is about 23% fat. And you take that fat and about a third of that fat is saturated fat, the bad one, and the bad fat, the one that raises your cholesterol and is linked to Alzheimer's. So no, for people who are trying to get their cholesterols down, Chicken is a terrible way to go. But when you send the chicken to the laboratory, they're going to tell you something else. Cooked chicken has compounds called heterocyclic amines. They're carcinogenic. Every cancer researcher knows that they're carcinogenic. And they're, frankly, in any cooked meat. But the number one source is chicken. So you go and get a grilled chicken sandwich for your daughter at Burger King thinking you're doing a good thing because it's not the beef. Um, there are heterocyclic, heterocyclic amines right there along with the fat, along with the cholesterol, along with the salmonella if you got the chicken at the store. So no, chicken is not a plant. Let's take a question from Lynx here at 1221. Should you eat more fat if you are working out? No. Your body isn't burning very much fat, um, at least not uh, unless the workout is really long and you've used up all your glycogen. So no, uh, what your body is going to need, you run two, three miles, something like that. Your body needs carbohydrate to restore the glycogen, which was the stored carbohydrate in your liver and in your muscles. You use that up as you ran and the carbohydrate will bring it back. What's carbohydrate? It's the starch in grains and Root, vegetable, root vegetables and beans and the natural sugars and fruit. We have somebody who is watching right now whose ears perked up just a minute ago when we were talking about PCOS. They said, well, look, I have PCOS too. Dr. Barnard, can you talk a little bit more about how a plant-based diet can help with that? Okay. Um, again, thank you for asking about this because as I mentioned earlier, it's been such a mystery. And, and uh, we will touch on this a little bit, but please, if you have a chance, to go to the library and pick up my book, Your Body in Balance. There's an entire chapter devoted to it. Um, share it with your doctor, share it with other women you know who've got PCOS because they are scratching their heads, they are frustrated. And um, we don't have all the answers, but we've got a lot of them. So please do, do have a look at, at the chapter in Your Body in Balance. Okay, let's go back. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome is a condition that's over time we've, we've learned what it's about. It's actually at its base, a genetic tendency to make just a little bit of androgen. Androgen, you can think of as male sex hormones. All men have male hormones and some female hormones, uh, some testosterone, some testosterone and androgens, some estrogens. Uh, for women, it's the same that you've got a little bit of male hormone and a lot of female hormone. With PCOS, that balance is shifted just a touch. So you've got still plenty of female hormones, but you've got a little bit of androgen, a little bit extra male hormone that manifests at maybe as a, a dark hair here or there, a little bit of thinning uh, at your scalp. Um, and you see these cysts on the ovaries and so forth. As time has gone on, we've learned a lot more about this. What we've learned is that the condition is also often manifest by insulin resistance, where the cells are not responding. And that causes the testosterone issues to get worse. The answer to it, in addition to talking with your doctor and having whatever treatments your, your doctor may prescribe, a low fat plant-based diet zeroes in and tackles that insulin resistance directly. In addition, the fiber content of the diet helps your body to eliminate excess androgens a little bit. And by reducing the fat content, that helps your, your, you to get into balance a little bit better too. And in your body and balance, I describe Alison Tierney's story, which we were just mentioning a little bit. And she and her husband were struggling 
um, to, to have a baby. And she went on the plant-based diet, as, as, you, as you'll see, and uh, got pregnant. She's got the most beautiful baby now. And um, this doesn't mean that the PCOS goes away. What we're trying to do is to make it manageable so it doesn't interfere with your life so much. So have a look. Let's take a question from Sally at 1223. She said, so many people are developing chronic kidney disease. What are the dietary reasons for this? Is there a connection? Yeah, there, there is a connection and, and mostly indirect. Um, you eat an animal-based diet, fat gets into your muscle cells and liver cells. That causes them to be insulin resistant. That leads to diabetes, and diabetes is a killer for the kidneys. Similarly, these same foods raise your blood pressure, and high blood pressure is devastating to the kidneys too. That's the main thing. Um, so when we're on a plant-based diet, our diabetes gets under better control. It might even go away. Blood pressure typically comes down, um, and that's going to protect the, the kidneys too. Now, there's a lot more to it. So if you've got kidney disease, see a good registered dietitian. Plan out your diet and preserve your kidney function to the extent that you can, but you do not want any animal products in your diet. You really want to preserve your kidneys. Here we go. Another avocado question. This one with a twist, Dr. Barnard, comes to us from Denise at 1225. Is avocado oil bad for you? Um, much better than chicken fat and lard because the saturated fat content is lower. But it's not zero. There's still a trace of saturated fat in there. And like any other fat, it's got nine calories in every gram, which means that any kind, any kind of oil, whether it's avocado oil or extra virgin olive oil or any kind, it, these are the densest, uh, the, the food's densest in calories of any. Um, again, it's not as bad as animal fat, but you would, I, I would suggest minimizing it as well. All right. Here's a question from Not Mars. I think that they're asking this for someone in their family because uh, they themselves are eating a strictly plant-based diet, but they want to know, are there any health concerns when it comes to eating honey? Uh, honey is really just sugar, but it's just made by a bee. Um, it's, it, it sounds more romantic, um, but no, it's, it, it's not health food either. All right. This is a, this is a, maybe a, a, a health 301 level question here. Let's see if we can get Janice an answer though. She said that there are studies showing that eating large amounts of legumes and whole grains can block zinc absorption, but since they're staples of a plant-based diet, what can we do to decrease the risk of zinc deficiency? Not worry about it would be my guess. Um, you talk to your doctor if you have any concerns and you want to, want to look at your diet in more detail, but it really isn't an issue that we see uh, um, manifesting. And zinc is a metal. You need tiny traces of it. There's plenty of it in plant foods. You're not going to get deficient. All right. And let's see. One more question from Brian. Wants to know, are there any plant-based foods that are better for lowering cholesterol than others? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. The short answer is there are some special effect foods. Um, let's start, though, with the basics. Um, getting away from all animal products is important. If you've got a high cholesterol. For the next 60, 90 days, no animal products at all, because when you make that choice, there's no animal fat and no cholesterol in your diet. Step two, keep oils really low because they have traces of the fats that can raise cholesterol. Step three, let's add those special effect foods. And what are they? One is soy, one is oats, one is certain nuts. And I was mentioning this earlier that for some reason that hasn't been entirely clear, Almonds and some other nuts, walnuts, they do seem to have this, this slight cholesterol lowering effect. And finally, for extra credit, if you want, I don't necessarily recommend this, but there are some plant-based margarines on the market that are specifically designed to include stanols and sterols that, that lower cholesterol. And this combination was made famous by David Jenkins at the University of Toronto. He calls it the portfolio diet. And you add to your portfolio vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans because they don't have cholesterol or animal products and add these special effect foods. And the cholesterol lowering is rapid and impressive. 
All right. And that's going to do it for the doctor's mailbag this week. If we didn't get to your question, I promise you we will save it. We will hold on to it and we will do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So don't be shy about posting it still in the comments or the chat box. And of course, you can also tweet it to me at Chuck Carroll WLC with the hashtag exam room live. And again, we will do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. But Dr. Barner, I couldn't wrap up the show today without mentioning what's happening right now over in England. It is the biggest tennis tournament of the year, Wimbledon. And earlier this morning, Novak Djokovic, he's eating a 100% plant-based diet. He cruised on into the third round. But then really momentous thing happened yesterday. Venus Williams, Wimbledon champion. Venus Williams won her 90th match at the All England Lawn and Tennis Club. And that puts her, I think, number five on the list for most all time for women at Wimbledon. That is a huge feat. And she's done that eating an exclusively plant-based diet. I mean, if that isn't a testimony for uh, how much that can benefit your body, I'm not sure what is. We have seen this so much in the world of athletics. It really started with the long distance runners, Carl Lewis. Um, and then obviously Scott Jurek and, and Brendan Brazier and um, uh, Rich Roll and so many others have really shown this. And there was just, uh, you probably saw, there was a new record set for um, this enormous hundred mile run around Central Park going round and round and round. And there was the, the, the champion who won it said he wanted to see if a vegan could do it. And then he realized that the reason he could do it was because he was vegan. <laughs> so just bursting through the times. But but then obviously, you know, what's tennis? Tennis is a strength sport and an endurance sport. You know, if you're going to last <laughs> set after set after set, you've got to, you're an endurance athlete. Um, but with Venus, what really happened was a little bit different. Um, obviously, she, you, you, you want all those benefits from a vegan diet, but she needed something in addition. And that's that she had an autoimmune condition. And it's Sjogren's disease. And Sjogren's disease is a condition where uh, you, you notice dry eyes and dry mouth and so forth, but your energy just goes to the floor. And her, her career was, was, was really just tanked. Um, so what did she do? She goes on a plant-based diet. Uh, I'm talking vegan diet. And of course, her sister Serena said, you're doing it, you know, I'm right behind you. Um, and she got her game back. And yeah, she's at Wimbledon and she just, you know, tears it up. So um, for, for all of these athletes, it's a, it's a terrific thing. And there's every reason to do it. And of course, after that, it, it, it got into every other sport. You know, Lewis Hamilton is uh, someone you and I have talked about, about many, many times where you need concentration <laughs> when you're going down the, the track at 200 miles an hour. Um, and then it got into basketball and it got into football. And uh, vegan diets now are, I think, kind of viewed as a really good option for athletes. What I think we're going to see in the next three or four or five years is that it is the diet for athletes. Um, and uh, anyway, we, actually, Chuck, if you don't mind, can I just share one other one other thing about this? Oh, abso absolutely. Forgive me, forgive me for belaboring this, but I, I just got to share this. There was a study in Japan that I want to tell you about because it relates exactly to this. They looked at Japanese female athletes and they happened to notice something. They noticed that for some of them, um, during their menstrual cycle, they, they weren't really performing particularly well. And which you can imagine if you got some pain or cramping or you just don't feel like yourself, your performance is not going to be so good. But then they also looked at the gut microbiome of those women who were not doing so well. And they noticed that it seemed to be more like a Western gut microbiome, meaning the bacteria in your gut. It's not the kind of typical uh, pattern that women would have in on a Japanese diet. And the reason that matters is that all the tofu and so forth that people are eating, it's metabolized by your gut microbiome. And if it's a healthy microbiome, it releases natural healthy compounds that make you feel great and you do well and you can perform better. It looks like these athletes who are not doing so well, they were training, they were working hard, they were as, as endowed as any athlete's gonna be, but they were eating like Americans. Um, they thought, you know, I need milk. I need, you know, the usual things that it's on the American training table. And so just as America is getting away from that, Japan was getting into it and it's hurting their performance. Um, in this case, because of the hormonal ramifications of this diet. So I know this is complicated stuff, but what we're discovering is that whether you're Venus Williams or you're any other athlete, 
strength, endurance, any kind of athlete. A plant-based diet is what you want. And the more that people get away from that, the more it hurts their endurance, it's gonna hurt, hurt their concentration, it's gonna cause other symptoms to interfere, um, inflammation gets worse. There's every reason to go on this simple, healthy, plant-based regimen that's uh, important for athletes and frankly important for everybody else too. Yeah, you mentioned endurance. It's not just for a single game or a match or a race. I mean, you're talking about a career that can endure. Venus is 41 years old eating that strictly plant-based diet, still out there cutting it up with people in their teens and in their 20s. And then you look at a guy like Tom Brady who eats primarily a plant-based diet. He just won the Super Bowl last year. He's about to turn 172, I think. I mean, he's been playing <laughs> football, you know, since the dawn of man. Uh, it, it's just really remarkable. I would have to think that there's also something to that aspect as well. Yeah. And if your goal is not just to extend your professional football career, but just to extend the healthy years in your life, um, this simple plant-based diet, it, it's deceptive because it seems too easy. Um, you're eating vegetables and fruits and beans and grains, and you're just throwing aside the animal products. The power of doing that day after day is enormous. And uh, by the way, we, we did a big Q&A about plant-based athletics last week with Robert Cheek and Matt Frazier. They just released the bestseller, The Plant-Based Athlete. It's, it's that how-to guide, Dr. Barnard, you were talking about um, a, a little bit earlier. And it really is a phenomenal interview. You can go back on our YouTube channel and look for that or hop over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee and uh, hit that subscribe button. It's completely free. And pull up and listen to that interview. It is just fantastic. We went almost an hour diving into the ins and outs of this. It was just a really fascinating conversation. So if you get the opportunity, please check that out. And also, before we go, I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their continued support of the exam room. I mean, just what they do is just so remarkable. It was born out of the passion and the love that Greg Ryder had for animals and helping people adopt the plant-based diet animal welfare issues. And if you have a moment, I highly encourage you please to check out the Gregory Ryder Memorial Fund online at gregoryriderfund.org. That's Ryder, R-E-I-T-E-R, fund.org. Check them out. Subscribe to their newsletter. I just can't say enough good things about the fund and Allison Mahoney, who is just doing such a great job of running that, Dr. Barnard. Let me second that, Chuck. Uh, Allison has done such a wonderful job of remembering Greg in this compassionate and generous way. Outstanding. And for today, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you one more time to you, Dr. Barnard, for being here. Thank you for your wisdom as always. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you so very much for tuning in. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.